Well, good morning again to my audience. It's a pleasure coming to you again this morning with another Sunday School lesson. I trust you all have had a very beautiful week and enjoyed life as you go through the changes that we are presently um, going through. Uh, we have a continuation of the lessons that we've been studying about Paul, Paul's first letter to Timothy. And last Sunday we studied about praying for all men. And this Sunday we are going to be looking at um, the subject of women in the church. So we will have a short lesson on that this morning. So before I go into the lesson, I want to ask the Lord to bless us. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for your blessings another week. We thank you, dear Lord, for raising us up from our bed this morning and to see this another beautiful Sunday morning. We pray, dear Lord, that your Holy Spirit will go with us and before us and lead our path and direction through this day. We pray that you will bless each and every one, dear Lord, that is tuned in to this program this morning, that your word will speak to them, dear Lord. And as I impart your word, dear Lord, we, I pray that your Holy Spirit will help me, dear Lord, to be clear and to give out the proper instructions, dear Lord, and that others will learn from your word, dear Lord. Pray that you may help that everything will be said and done decently and in order. And I give you thanks for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, thank you for um, listening in again this morning and uh, trust that you will be blessed as we study this beautiful lesson this morning. Now, uh, as I was I said earlier, we we're talking about Paul instructing Timothy as to how he should conduct himself and how he should uh, lead the, the church work that he was um, um, put in place to, to, to lead. So, so Paul gave him several different um, angles of how to, to deal with these situations. And uh, last Sunday we, we talked about praying for all men. And the, the scripture this morning is going to be picking up from verse 9, leaving off from um, Timothy 2, uh, where Paul was instructing how we should pray for kings and in those in authority and um, etc. And verse 8, um, I would like to read so we can pick up in verse 9 and understand where we're coming from with that verse. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's verse 8 of um, 1 Timothy 2. And, okay? 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And now going into the switch over here now to where he started to instruct about women, um, how they should conduct themselves. He says in verse 9, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with roided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to use their authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and with sobriety. So let's look at verse 9 here and um, understand what some of these words here mean. And 
the word adorn means that when you beautify or you, you're decking out, um, it says also dressing up or doll up, which um, is a common word we use among ourselves, and to enhance. So that's what adorn means, to beautify, to enhance, to, to dress up or doll up, okay? And pay attention carefully to um, the meaning of these words. Um, and let's look at shamefacedness. What shamefacedness uh, mean? What, what it means to be shamefaced? What it means to be shamefaced is to be embarrassed, to be disgraced, to feel guilty, and to be humbled. Okay? So, uh, sobriety means self restraint and temperance. Okay? So, you can gather from these words here that Paul was um, bringing to Timothy's attention that the women, um, when they are praying or uh, are in their, their, their lifestyle, should remember that they need to conduct themselves or contain themselves with such um, sobriety, with such shamefacedness, and also to be modest. Okay? And um, because Paul was, was, was called to teach the Gentiles, his main purpose in the ministry was to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. So you can imagine that Paul um, encountering uh, differences in how uh, the Gentiles dress, their, 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 their culture was different, their lifestyle um, w w was different than what the Jews were. And Timothy was a, an, an under-shepherd of his who he was grooming to take on the responsibility of leading and pastoring some of these people. So he had to instruct Timothy as how to deal with these um, issues that he would be facing because he would certainly face some differences there. And for those of us who travel, when we travel, we see people in their different country, with different customs of dressing and styles and so forth, and um, the, the way that they conduct themselves in their, in their, in their dress code. So that's natural that you're going to find that difference among people and different um, ethnicity and so forth. So Paul was making sure that he brought this to uh, Timothy's attention. Now let's look at uh, what the meditation has to say in modest apparel. And for the church of God has a standard and we should not kick our heels against that. We must remember, God is a God of order. God is a God of decency, and he said to do all things decently and in order. And the work, when you are called or you're born into the family of God, there should be some changes. The Bible says that if you are converted, you are a new creature. Some of the old things that you used to do, that was not right. You're going to make changes. So if you were, uh, before coming to know Christ, used to dress a, diff a certain way and had certain, you know, lifestyle about you, when you come in contact with the Holy Spirit and with God, it's going to convict you and um, bring to your attention that these things need to change and you need to do something about them. So the church has a standard. Uh, that standard is set forth in the Word of God. Simeth in the book um, uh, referred to, commenting on these verses, said, These articles of adornment then are of, not are of humility and modesty, but by pride in the heart. Uh, what, what caused us not to want to adhere to 
proper uh, dr dress code is usually pride in the heart, right? It's pride in the heart. And we're living in a world that there is so much of that. Hardly anyone wants anyone to tell them what to do and how to do. Everybody thinks, well, they can do as, they're ple as they please and, 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 and get by. But I'm here to say, you may do as you please, but God is taking note. And you're not going to prosper in his work or his service doing as you please. But we are to do as he requires of us. So um, there is a standard in the way that a Christian should dress. Modest apparel requires clothing that is comfortable, clean and neat, so as not to become immodest, okay? And we know when we are immodest, whether we are men or women, we know when we put on some type of clothing and it's not properly um, and conduce, it's not proper and conducive to our, our, our faith and our belief as Christians. So we should understand that clearly. So it's, we should be comfortable in what we, we are wearing. So not to become immodest. Through the failure to measure up to ordinary standards of decency. But on the other hand, it is the dress that is free from useless worldly trimmings and accompaniments. So we need to not look like a movie star, as it were, let me put it that way. We don't want to look too glamorous and to bring attention to ourselves. But that's what Paul is telling um, Timothy here. But that which becometh women professing godliness with good works, right? We need to be able to set the right example. As a woman, you need to set that right example and standard for others to see that you are a Christian. You are not a, a, a model out there walking the plank. You are not a movie star that, you know, how they line up when they're having their Grammys and so forth. You don't want to look like that as a Christian. You want to know that your body is well clad and that you look decent and you know look beautiful nothing wrong with that but you know when you're going over the edge so I don't need to go deep into that you are like women and you all know that so um, in, instead of worldly and modest clothing let each strive to adorn themselves with godliness and good works Peter says let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the adornment of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, great a great price. Okay, so instead of trying to get the world's attention by the things we put on, let us get the world's attention by our meek spirit, by the good things that we do. For Christ and in in Christ right that's where the emphasis should be not on our outward adornment to bring attraction to us but we should from the inside out bringing qualities out that will touch people's lives and make them to to understand that there is a difference in the way that you are you're leading your life and your, your walk with Christ, okay? Um, so that's on the subject of modesty. Now we're talking about women in the church. And um, let's look also now as a woman, as a teacher. And in Acts 8, 26, we read, and the big... And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, who, whom when they, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him into unto them and expound unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now we're talking about women in the church, okay? 
So here is another account where Aquila and Priscilla had the encounter with this very brilliant um, and eloquent uh, speaker and follower of Christ by the name of Apollos. But Apollos was preaching and teaching, instructing, and certain things that he was teaching was not to the standard of what Christianity was. So Priscilla heard him, and she was a very strong, seasoned um, Christian uh, follower, and she realized that he was not um, adhering or did not understand perhaps some of the, the standards of the church and etc. So she and her husband took him aside and expound to him the gospel. And he listened, right? You know, sometimes women can get our attention as men, whereas a man to man, it might not work that well. So, and how Priscilla pursue him, and let's hear what the, the, the um, meditation says here. A woman teacher. Apollos was a powerful minister of the gospel. Yet we see that Priscilla, and she is usually listed first, and her husband Aquila, took this man of God and expound unto him the way of God more perfectly. Right? That's the key word there. Perfectly. More perfectly are the key words. More perfectly. Yes, he had uh, a knowledge of the truth, but he did not have it in perfection or he, he wasn't too sure. He, he probably was stumbling on some things. Okay? So a woman can teach men when it comes to exercising a spiritual gift in the work of the church. In fact, some seem to think Priscilla was a minister herself. And this quote from the book, Everyone in the Bible, uh, by Wim P. Parker, might be of interest. Um, Priscilla, the wife of Aquila, was a staunch supporter of Paul and a mature Christian leader in the early church. Priscilla and Aquila, as Jews, remember now these were Jews, right? So like I said earlier, the Jews' standard from, was different from the Gentiles, okay? And maybe Apollos was converted as, an, as a Gentile, I'm not too sure about that, what his, his, his nationality was. But the Jews had different ways of worshiping than the Gentiles were, okay? So Priscilla and Aquila as Jews had been expelled from Rome and lived at Corinth when Paul met them. They worked together earning their living as tent makers and getting to the small colony of Christians started. Paul also was a tent maker by trade, so naturally they gravitated together, okay? They accompanied Paul to Ephesus and stayed there, with, there when Paul traveled on to Jerusalem. Priscilla showed himself a person of exceptional tact and maturity. When she connected some of the error, corrected some of the errors in the preaching of the brilliant young apostle uh, Apollos, the church at Ephesus met in their house after the riots against Christians. They shift to, shifted to Rome again and later back to Ephesus. Priscilla apparently was more permanent than her husband. Her name preceded her husband in four out of the six references of them recorded in the Bible. Although both were highly regarded as early missionaries. And so here we see that there was a very influential woman of God that was able to help Apollos to understand 
in a more perfect way the words of God. Okay? So a woman can instruct and a woman is called in the in the work of God. There are places in the in the work for of God for women. By the way, if it had not been for women, where would the church be today? You go to most churches and you find that there are more women there than there are men. Sad to say, but that's the, the, the truth. I mean, sad on the part of men. But very strong and um, courageous and applaud by the women. Sorry. So women are sometimes the backbone of the, the, the work of um, the church. So uh, let's look now at another uh, individual. As, and we look at Romans 16 and 1. Romans 16 and 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centura. So here we have another woman, Phoebe, who is mentioned as the original Greek Rome, Romans 16.1 clearly shows that Phoebe, a woman, was a deaconess of the church. Now, the office of a deacon was a distinct public official position in the church. This was no secret, okay? She was publicly known in our community, in, among our church brethren, right? So, um, and it is a can, and it she it's she was a candidate where it was publicly ordained by the laying on of the hands of the apostle. So there we see another woman who was called and ordained as a deaconess in the work. Okay, so women has places in the church. Um, in the gospel day, now I like to read this here before we conclude um, I will pour out my spirit and listen to what Joel had to say um, back in those days Joel 2.28 and it shall come to pass after that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh take note of that all flesh and your sons your sons and your daughters shall prophesy shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see vision so here we see that joel prophesied that in time to come the spirit was going to come up on these um, people and i read that verse again and it shall come to pass afterward that i will pour out of my spirit this is god's spirit upon all flesh upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So there's a mix here. The sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. They shall uh, be able to be teachers. They shall be able to be uh, ministers, deaconess, um, you know, whatever office that they will be called upon in the work of the church. <coughs> um, <coughs> sorry. Okay, so the, the primary significance of the term prophecy is to speak forth, to tell out the message or the mysteries of God. So there Joel was saying that the young men and the young women will prophesy, they will speak forth, they will tell out the message or the mysteries of God, not in a secret closet but publicly, right? Publicly. In other words, to preach the gospel of salvation to sinners and holy living to the saints. Peter confirms the fact that this prophecy was fulfilled in the New Testament. You remember on the day of Pentecost when the 120 was all together and when the, the, the assembly there taught they, and the Holy Spirit came down on them and they all spoke with different um, tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance and the, those that were looking on said that they were drunk and Peter got up and he spoke and said no no we are not drunk as you think we are 
but this is that which was prophesied by Joel the prophet that in the latter times these things would come about. So there they were able to hear the apostles and those that were assembled there and obviously there was some woman among there that um, was able to, to, to speak up too, right? And why Paul was, uh, Peter was able to say this is that which was prophesied that in the latter days I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your young men and, your, and, and women shall prophesy. So it was fulfilled there. <clears throat> women help Paul in the gospel. Philippians 4 and 3. What does that say? And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. So here Paul was instructing to encourage these women, right? Help them because they were an, an asset to the work, his work, and that he was doing, and to the work of God, and that they, their names were in the book of life, okay? So women are called upon to minister in the work of God. They're not just to sit in the, in, in the church and be silent as some um, works or, or movements teach. They are, they are um, ordained by God to, to be um, vocal, and to, to take on responsibilities and carry on the ministry of the church. And like I said, women are a great asset in the church today, and they carry a lot of the, the weight of the, the everyday um, services of the church. Now, conclusion. Um, in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, we read where Paul instructs the women of that congregation to keep silent in the church. We also read, in this same letter, chapter 11, where he told the women to continue to wear, to, to wear the cloth head covering, although not required by God. But he let them know the church of God as a whole had no such customs. Notice in the last part of 1434, if you look those up, Paul says, I also say, said the law, the Jewish woman, had to set apart from the men in the synagogue in a balcony if there was one. The men were allowed to interrupt the speaker, at least in some services, and ask questions. The women were not. If they had any questions, they were to ask their husband when they got home. It, if this was a ban against women having any part in the worship service everywhere, then how do we explain that Philip had four daughters which did prophesy? And you'll find that in Acts 21 and 9. How do we explain Joel's prophecy that I, that I just mentioned there, where he said, I will pour out his spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Surely the Holy Spirit would not give a gift to anyone if he or she was forbidden by the word of God to use it. So that clears it up there. Women are also called to the ministry. Okay? This lesson, um, so this lesson I trust has been a, a blessing to you and an enlightenment to, for you as women to understand is um, that you are called, you have a purpose, you have uh, a work to do in the church and don't be intimidated about it but just follow the, the, the standards of the, of the Bible um, in applying what is true what is decent um, going back to, to, to the, the first part of the lesson there uh, in modesty etc you know conduct yourself in the way that become it a Christian. You know, you, you can look like a Christian, but inwardly you are a devil, excuse my harsh language there, 
But I've seen those people. They dress, look that what they think calls saintly, but then they have so much hatred, hatred in, in them and gall and bitterness. That is not what Christianity is about. It's not about how you look on the outside altogether, but it's what comes out from inside. That's what defiles us, right? And so we should not judge people by how they look, um, but by their, the, the, the contribution that they make inwardly and the spirit that they have inwardly. Yes, all might not have been able to come to the knowledge of the truth in the, the act of modest dressing, but that does not disqualify them from that they are not, not Christians. So we have to be very careful how we judge people, okay? I just wanted to say that. We do not judge people because of their outward appearance, right? Women, we love you. We appreciate you. We love your, your ministry. And we encourage you to, to continue to work for God. Because the Bible also said, for those men who are not coming along, your faithfulness will bring them to to, to the cross. So be faithful. Continue to pray for your, 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 your spouse if he's not a Christian. And be encouraged. God is using you and he wants you to continue to work in his ministry. May God bless each and every one. Have a blessed week. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. We pray that you will bless us and guide us, dear Lord, and empower us, dear Lord, with the knowledge of your word, dear Lord, and help us, dear Lord, to apply our hearts unto wisdom as you give um, light on our path. Bless us and give us a beautiful week, we pray in Jesus' name.